Welcome to another video talking about software architecture. In this case, we are going to talk about managing architecture debt. Uh, and we begin with this quote by Agda Nash, where he mentions that some debts are fun when you're acquiring them, but none are fun when you set about retiring them. For those of you who aren't familiar with Agda Nash, he is a famous poet from the 1900s who uh, had a lot of humorous poems. And this is an example of it, because he, he talks about the fact that people enjoy spending money, but they don't enjoy paying back the money they spent. And architecture debt is called debt for a reason, because it's a type of technical debt, which, you know, is very painful to retire. So let's uh, talk about our outline here. So we're going to talk about managing architecture debt um, as a type of technical debt. We'll talk about how to determine when you have an a architecture debt problem. We'll talk about discovering potential hotspots. We'll give an example. We'll talk about some automated tools. And that'll pretty much wrap up the uh, chapter. So how do we arrive with architecture debt? Well, just as software code over time can become uncontrollable and more difficult to maintain and give rise to technical debt, architecture designs also become harder to maintain as they evolve over time. Every time you need to make a change, this change, that change, this patch, this patch, um, it makes what started off as a very simple design become much more complicated. And so this um, this sort of entropy approach uh, where you gradually break down is called architecture debt. And it's an important and expensive form of technical debt. Now, one of the main approaches to dealing with technical debt is to um, do refactoring, where you refactor the code and try and get back to a, a pristine design uh, you do using, uh, and that's the sort of approach you can also do with architecture debt. However, having said that, not all debt is bad debt. Sometimes a principle can be violated when there is a worthy trade-off. Uh, for example, you might sacrifice low coupling or high cohesion to improve your runtime performance or uh, have a faster time to market. So how do we identify technical debt? Uh, and in particular, how do we uh, identify uh, architecture debt? Well, generally speaking, the way to determine whether or not you uh, have architecture debt is to focus on several different types of information. First, Look at the source code. This can help you identify structural dependencies. You know, you can look at for cyclic dependencies and other types of source code issues. Second, look at the revision history is extracted from the project's uh, version control system. This can be used to determine the coevolution of the code units. You can see where things were copied from other things. You can see all, you can trace a lot of it from the version control system. The third place to look at architecture debt is to look at your your issue information system. Um, usually uh, the issues are stored in the issue control system, and that can be used to determine the reason for changes. You know, we're fixing this bug, uh, this other user requested this uh, modification, so they go to market, you know. Um, you'd have your list of changes and why the changes happened. And so you can analyze debt by identifying areas of the architecture that are experiencing unusually high rates of bugs and attempt to associate those symptoms with design flaws. So how do you determine whether or not you have an architecture debt problem? How do you determine if a group of files is architecturally connected? So the way the approach I'm, I'm recommending is that you focus on the physical manifestation of the architectural elements, which is the files in which the source code is stored. Well, one way to identify static dependencies is to use a, a static analysis tool. 
you know, looking at, you know, this method calls that method. So you can look at um, dependencies between the methods. Another approach is to look at the evolutionary dependence between files in the project. Uh, that, that evolutionary dependency uh, occurs when two files change together. And you can get that information from your revision control system. So you can represent file de dependencies using a design structure ma matrix, uh, which is really just an Excel spreadsheet where you've got files of rows and columns, and then you annotate the dependencies in the cells that cross-reference to the rows and the columns. So here's an example of a... Uh, design structure matrix uh, for on one of the Apache open source projects. In this case, it's Apache Camel. And so you can see um, some of these annotations in here are structural. Some of them are, you know, show low coupling, um, you know, and, and so on. you would hope that um, it's lower diagonal. That is that all of the entries appear on the diagonal or below the diagonal. If you have entries that appear above the diagonal, that can indicate that you have a cyclic dependency. So for example, this entry up here is an indication of a cyclic dependency. Now Apache Camel is an open source integration framework. Um, Uh, but generally, you would get those static dependencies by uh, running one of these uh, static analysis tools against the code, and it would discover that, hey, you know, um, you're, you're making calls you shouldn't be making. Now, here is another version of a design matrix for Apache Camel, but this time including co-change information. Um, now, historical co-change information is that information coming from the version control system, so we can see which components were changed the same time as these other components. Um, and so this makes the diagram a lot harder to read because you get lots of additional entries. You know, here we have a few entries. All of a sudden, we got all these entries up here. And furthermore, we've got a lot of entries up here in the, in the upper half, and this no longer means that this is just uh, cyclic dependencies. There's other reasons for putting stuff up here. But what this does tell you is that every time you make a change with one component, there are lots of other components that need to change with those component, certain components. And so that tells you that uh, potentially um, making changes to some of these components is extremely costly and problematic. This is a very tangled set of code. So if you suspect that your code base is architecture debt, perhaps bug rates are going up and feature velocity is going down, you need to identify the specific files and their flawed relationships that are creating the debt. You need to identify the hotspots. Um, so we call these sets of elements that make um, that are the problem children that make outsized contributions to the cost of the system hotspots. So to identify hotspots, we look for anti-patterns that contribute to high coupling and low cohesion. Uh, just a reminder, an anti-pattern is a pattern of something not to do. So some of the common anti-patterns that lead to debt include the following. Uh, the first one is an unstable interface. The second one is modularity violation. The third is unhealthy inheritance. Uh, the fourth is cyclic dependency, which I mentioned earlier. Fifth is package cycle. And sixth is crossing. Let's dive into each of these in a little more detail. So with the unstable interface anti-pattern, um, an influential file, one which represents an important service or resource or an abstraction in the system, changes frequently with its dependence. 
as recorded in our co revision history. The interface file is the entry point for other system elements to use a service or resource, and it is frequently modified due to uh, internal reasons, changes to the API, and so on. To identify this ANI pattern, what you would do is search for a file with a large number of dependents that is modified frequently with other files. Our next anti-pattern is modularity violation, uh, where structurally decoupled modules frequently change together. Uh, to identify this anti-pattern, search for two or more structurally independent files, files that have no structural dependency on each other, and that actually do change together frequently. Um, our third one is unhealthy inheritance. Again, this would be in an object-oriented programming uh, language. A base class depends on its subclasses or a client class depends on the base class and one or more of its subclasses. To determine unhealthy inheritance, search for either of the following two sets of relationships in a design matrix. In an inheritance hierarchy, a parent depends on its child class. In inheritance hierarchy, a client of the child class hierarchy depends on both the parent and one or more of its children. So basically, in a normal uh, inheritance hierarchy, the children depend on the parent. So here what we're saying is, you know, so you've got, uh, you know, child B depends on parent A is the normal way it works. But we're here what we're saying, unhealthy inheritance, you know, child A, I'm sorry, child B depends on parent A, but parent A also depends on child B. So you've got sort of the cyclical inheritance going on, and that causes all kinds of programming problems uh, and bugs. And related to that, we've got cyclic dependency, which is basically a um, a larger version than unhealthy inheritance. You can think about unhealthy inheritance as being a subcategory of cyclic dependency. In a cyclic dependency, a group of files is tightly connected. To identify this anti-pattern, search for sets of files that form a strongly connected graph where there's a structural dependency path between any two elements of the graph. So again, with cyclic dependency, you're looking at something like um, B depends on A, C depends on B, and then A depends on C. So it turns out everything's a cycle and everybody depends on everybody else. Um, it could be as simple as A depends on B and B depends on A, but usually there's some middlemen to make it harder to spot. Let's talk about package cycle anti-pattern. Uh, two or more packages depend on each other. Rather than form a hierarchical structure, again, this is a subcategory of cyclic dependencies. Uh, detecting this pattern, anti-pattern is similar to detecting a cyclic dependency. The package cycle is determined by discovering packages that form a connected graph. And finally, a crossing. A file has both a high number of dependent files and a high number of files on which it depends, and it changes frequently with its dependence and the files it depends on. To determine the file at the center of a crossing, search for a file that has both high fan in and fan out and substantial code change relations with other files. So some of these examples of anti-patterns you can discover just using your matrix and looking at uh, and doing static code analysis and spotting the dependencies. Some of the other ones, you have to look at what's being changed simultaneously. So you want to look at the versions, see after there's a change where everything else also is changing, and then realize, hey, this is what's going on here. Now, not every file in a hotspot is going to be tightly coupled with every other file. Instead, a collection might be tightly coupled to some and decoupled from others. Here is an example showing cyclic dependencies in another Apache open source project. In this case, it's Apache Cassandra, which is a widely used NoSQL database. Um, you can see um, the dependencies shown here that we circled on line eight and on uh, row eight. Um, there's also an unhealthy inheritance going on in this area over here in 14. Um, so, you know, there's like multiple uh, anti-patterns demonstrated here in this open source software project. Now, I'm using examples of open source projects uh, because obviously all the code's freely available and it's easy to use. Um, it's been my experience that uh, proprietary code that is not open source is generally even worse. 
Uh, and that open source is among some of the best projects that are out there. Um, and that code that is not closed source in many cases has a lot of problems with cyclic dependencies and other types of the, uh, some of the other anti-patterns that we've talked about. Uh, so let's talk about how to fix a hotspot once you have identified some. Well, most issues in an issue tracking system are either bug fixes or feature enhancements. Uh, bug fixes and bug-related and change-related churn are highly correlated with these anti-patterns and hotspots. In other words, those files that participate in anti-patterns and require frequent bug fixes are likely hotspots. And so for each file, you can determine the total number of bug fixes and changes and the total amount of churn that that file has experienced. So then you can sum up the bug fixes and the churn experienced by the files in the anti-pattern. And then you can sort of weight this and determine and quantify the amount of debt that's actually going on. And then what you can do is you can do a comparison uh, in terms of the level of effort it would take to do a refactor and deal with this and be able to quantify whether it would be beneficial to do a refactor or whether you really don't need to worry about it. So, for example, if there's a cyclic dependency, then you need to remove a dependency to break the cycle dependencies. And so the architect can look at that cyclic dependency, look at the level of effort it would take to refactor and remove the dependency, and then compare that against the number of uh, fixes that that cyclic dependency is causing and the amount of effort that's being spent on it in terms of bugs that are being generated by the cyclic dependency and justify the level of effort to remove this cyclic dependency because of the amount of money we would save in terms of bug fixing. So here's an example. This is done with uh, SoftServe, a multinational software uh, outsourcing company. At the time of the analysis, SoftServe had almost 800 source files and a revision history and issues over a two-year two period. And the SoftServe software was maintained by half a dozen full-time developers and a lot of occasional part-time contributors. So they had almost 3,000 issues in their JIRA issue tracker, which is uh, one of the different uh, issue trackers that are out there. And of those 3,000 issues, about one-third were bugs. And they had approximately 3,000 commits in their Git version control repository. And they identified approximately a third of their files as containing the most harmful anti-patterns and the most debt. And the number of defects associated with those three clusters was approximately 90%. So roughly 90% of the defects were with, you know, um, only one third of the files. So if you were able to fix the problems with those one third of the problems, you get rid of 90% of the bugs. So you can calculate the cost of these debts in terms of the lines of the code committed for bug fixes. Um, and so you calculate the average bug fixes and average number of bug fixes and then come up with some numbers on this and provide some annual savings based on level of effort for fixing this stuff. Um, and so and then they were able to project that and compare that the cost of refactoring would be much cheaper than the cost of continuing to do all these bug fixes. And part of the reason why that would be uh, even though you would think that, hey, why wouldn't isn't bug fixers cheaper than completely rewriting the code? Well, the thing is, is that every time they do a bug fix, they were breaking other stuff because of the cyclic dependency, because they weren't really fixing the cyclic dependency. Uh, and so all they were doing was putting a Band-Aid on and then something else would break. Um, you know, it's, it's like the old example of the leaky pipes and you plug one leak and something else starts leaking. Uh, because the water pressure is forcing the water to go somewhere else. Uh, and so the same thing is happening with software. And so if you fix the leaky pipes, so none of the pipes are leaky, then uh, you actually solve the problem. Now, there are all kinds of tools to help people do this sort of analysis. Tools for extracting issues from the issue trackers, 
tools from extracting logs from the revision control system, tools to revert re-engineer the uh, code base to identify uh, dependencies, tools to uh, look for the anti-patterns, and tools to calculate the technical debt associated with hotspots. So in summary, architecture debt is an important and costly form of technical debt. Compared to code-based technical debt, architecture debt is harder to identify because its root causes are distributed among files and the relationship. Whereas uh, code-based technical debt, you're usually looking at a single file or a couple files, architecture debt is usually the entire system or a large portion of the system. Um, the process of identifying architecture debt involves gathering information from issue trackers, revision control systems, source code, and so on. Um, now, you can identify anti-patterns um, and group those into hotspots and then quantify what the impact of those hotspots are. Um, architecture debt monitoring processes can be automated and built into a system's continuous integration tool suite. Once architecture debt has been identified, if it's bad enough, it should be removed through refactoring. And the output of this process provides quantitative data necessary to make the business case for refactoring uh, to project management. You can actually provide them the quantitative, quantitative data to say, hey, look, instead of continually seeing the pipes burst, let's replace the pipes and here's how much money you'll save. So thank you for listening to this uh, lecture on architecture debt. Tune in next time when we'll dive uh, deeper into another topic.